This is the Rugged Truth Podcast. I'm Dr. Brian Fergus. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the podcast. I think we have a very important question in front of us. And if you read the title to this podcast on one of those podcast platforms you're using, or if you saw the thumbnail on YouTube, you know that the question that we're going to wrestle today, wrestle with today is, is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Now, we're committed on the Rugged Truth podcast to answering real questions that real people ask about real life with Jesus. And you might think you already know the answer to that question. If you took a look at the title and thought, I don't need to listen to this one, uh, but I'll just see what Fergus is up to today. I, I appreciate you jumping in, but I want you to understand that rather than just answering this question with a few Bible verses, I also want us to talk about how to answer this question when we enter into conversations with people who don't necessarily believe the way we believe. Answering this question requires a certain amount of finesse in our culture if we want people to listen to what we have to say, right? We, we could just bulldoze through and say, yeah, Jesus is the only way to heaven, turn or burn. You know, we can, we can be like that. Or we can use a little bit of tact, creativity, and finesse when we answer that question so that we have the opportunity to explain not only what we believe, but, but why we believe it as well. Why does answering this particular question require so much finesse? Well, it's because we live in a pluralistic society here in America. And listen, I know that not everybody who's listening to the Rugged Truth podcast lives in America. We've got some folks listening in India. I saw in the analytics recently that we've got some folks even further east in Southeast Asia who are... Uh, tuning in to the Rugged Truth podcast, and I think that's just awesome. Welcome. We're glad you're here. But here in America, the reason we need to answer this question about is Jesus the only way with a certain amount of finesse is because we live in a very pluralistic society. That means that we live in a society where not everybody believes what we believe. All of the major world religions are adhered to by citizens in America. You know, there are plenty of uh, Muslim citizens and Jewish citizens and Christian citizens and Hindu citizens. You go on down the line of all the major world religions, they're represented probably in your neighborhood, in your area where you live. You'll find people who believe differently than you do, who hold to other faith systems, who adhere to other religions. And so uh, when we answer this question, we have to recognize that, that not everybody's going to believe what we believe. Not only that, we live in a very relativistic society. And, and this is the part that gets a little um, maddening for me. Uh, relativism is this idea that there is no such thing as absolute truth anymore. Uh, that uh, what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. I, I've never quite understood why people can embrace that idea because to say there is no such thing as absolute truth is a statement of absolute truth, right? They're embracing as an absolute truth the fact that there is no such thing as an absolute truth. It, it's so very confusing and, and honestly it just doesn't make any sense to me. Now listen, I don't want to get too heady or philosophical, but, but you see where I'm going. And in this relativistic culture where we find ourselves living, uh, the conversations today revolve around your truth versus my truth, as if we are the final determiners of truth. We've added that little possessive adjective, and, and people say, well, you know, what's true for you might not be true for me. Let, What's morally right for you might not be morally right for me. And, and, and that's just kind of um, silly. Discussions about your truth and, and my truth are really uh, counterproductive. Things are either true or they're not true. Everybody knows that, right? Everybody 
understands that these discussions about, you know, what's true for you or what's true for me, we all get that, that not everything can be true. There are some things that are false. We've just kind of numbed ourselves to that distinction. Maybe we've deadened that part of our brains or, or we just ignore the fact that, that truth is not necessarily relative, that there are absolute truth statements, that, that morality based on truth has consequences. I, I, think about it. If I decide that my truth is that it's okay for me to rob banks, and I go out and rob a bank, I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to spend time in prison. Maybe it's, it's time for a prison ministry. <laughs> I don't know. But you understand that we, not every truth can be true. And, and I, I've taken a little bit of time to get into this because it really gets to the heart of not only the question that I want us to, to explore in Scripture today, but it also gets to the heart of how we engage with people who answer this question. It's a big question. Is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Now, if you've watched the Rugged Truth podcast or listened to it uh, before, you, you probably know my worldview. You probably understand my presuppositions. I believe that's a true statement. I believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I, I believe that because I uh, embrace the Bible as God's inspired word without error in its original manuscripts. I believe that Jesus is telling me the truth about life and reality. He informs my worldview. And so I embrace the fact that Jesus really is the only way to heaven. But some could say, but you know, Fergus, yeah, but that's your truth. Well, of course it is. Of course it's my truth. It's a, it's a truth that I've embraced. But, but since there is such thing as absolute truth, there really is. Some things are right. Some things are wrong. Some things are true. Some things are false. Since there is such a thing as absolute truth, some of our truths are just false. They're wrong. And some say, oh, you Christians, you're just so narrow. You think that that's, you know, your way is the only right way. Listen, let's, let's just kind of debunk that myth right now by recognizing that every major world religion on this planet claims to be the right religion. <laughs> this is not just a, a Christian thing that we uh, hold to exclusivity of truth. That's not just us. Uh, people who adhere to the other major world religions also believe that theirs is the right religion. If they didn't believe it was the right religion, they'd be insane for holding to it. Right? So this isn't just a Christian thing. I, every major world religion believes that it is the right religion. And thankfully, we live here in America, and in free societies, we all agree that we can believe what we want to believe. We have uh, the choice to believe what we would want to believe. And, and listen, I would never want to take away that freedom, right? I would never want to take away the freedom of religion that makes America what it is. Because if we take away the freedom of someone else's religion, then who's to say that our freedom of religion won't be taken away at some point as well. So we'll just leave that one alone. Let's pray that we just leave that one alone so that we can all choose who we want to worship and how we want to worship them. But along with that choice comes the very free choice to choose to be wrong, <laughs> right? And, and I think some people do. I think some people are choosing to be wrong. Of course, they think they're choosing to be right, but but we disagree. And, and so I think when we get into this, these conversations about is Jesus really the only way to heaven, we have to kind of wade into it with some presuppositions. Here's the one I begin with. I begin with the fact that I believe what Jesus has to say. Now, there are other teachers and other religions who said some fine things as well, but, but for me, the starting point of this conversation is Jesus. I might have shared with you before my theological rule in life, and that is this. If Jesus says something, he's right. 
<laughs> so I embrace that as a part of my worldview and my faith system. And so I trust Jesus, but not just because he said some amazing things. I trust Jesus because he validated those sayings. He backed them up with miraculous events. Not only did he perform amazing miracles, but he performed the most amazing miracle of all. He resurrected from the dead. After being crucified to death, three days later, Jesus got back up and continued to live among his friends for many days before he ascended to heaven. And so Jesus' statements hold more credibility with me because of his miracles. A few episodes back, In the Rugged Truth podcast, we were talking about um, uh, things Jesus did to show us that he is God. There's this great story in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, where Jesus heals a man who's paralyzed. Maybe you remember this story. Um, Everybody's gathered in this house, and there's just no way in. And so this man's friends uh, get him up on the roof of this house, dig a hole, and lower him in front of Jesus. Do you remember that story? And Jesus is there, and and this uh, paralyzed man is there. Jesus looks at the paralyzed man and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. There's religious leaders in the room who are shocked that Jesus would say that. They they count that as blasphemy, uh, thinking only God can forgive sins. Jesus calls them on those thoughts and says, "Why, Why... Why does that freak you out that I forgave this guy's sins? But to prove to you that I have the authority to forgive sins, then he turns to the paralytic and says, stand up, go home. And the guy is healed, right? And so it's the healing miracle that validates the fact that Jesus has the authority and the right to forgive sins. So it's not that Jesus just says stuff. He backs up what he says with these miraculous events. In fact, uh, in the Gospel of John, he doesn't use the word miracles to describe these amazing miracles that Jesus performs. He uses the word signs because these events are signs that point us to the truth that Jesus is who he said he is and that ultimately Jesus really is the only way to heaven. I don't say that because I want everybody else to be wrong. I say that Jesus really is the only way to heaven because Jesus said that. Remember, the theological rule, if Jesus says something, he's right. And in John's gospel, he makes a blatant statement about that. In fact, this is the the verse that most of us go to when this conversation comes up is, is Jesus really the only way to heaven? We turn to the blatant statement that Jesus makes in John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You've heard that verse before, probably. Let me point out something that often gets uh, missed. I am the way, the truth, the life. We, We understand what he's saying. Then he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. The, the really important word in that passage is the word through. The idea is that, that Jesus is the doorway, the passage, that makes it possible for us to enter into an eternally fulfilling and satisfying relationship with our Heavenly Father in heaven. He is the way through so that we can have access to God. And and he's claiming exclusivity. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we could look at that and say, man, Jesus, you're being kind of hard-nosed about that. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus is ready to embrace anybody who wants to enter into a relationship with him. He is quick to receive all who are ready to put their faith and trust in him. He's not trying to keep anybody out. He wants everybody in, and he is the door. In fact, he says that in John. He is the door by which we enter into the Father's sheepfold in that particular analogy that he shares with us. We get this, right? Uh, Think about 
you're getting on an airplane, right? And uh, you go through the gate and you walk down that, that long hallway and there's the door to the plane. And you might think, well, it's unfair that there's just this one door. No, you're fine walking through the door because you know it's the only way to get on that plane so that you can fly to where you want to fly to. We're not offended by doors. And, and this statement that Jesus makes is an analogy of that. It's through him, coming through him, that allows us to connect with the Father eternally. But all of Jesus' statements are not as blatant as that one, right? Where Jesus just flat out says, I'm the only way to heaven. Others are implied. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 10, with verse 32, Jesus says something that I think is equally important. He's talking to his disciples and he's trying to encourage them to not be afraid to, to boldly proclaim their faith in him. And he says this in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. He says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Boy, the important word in that statement is, is acknowledge. What does Jesus mean by acknowledge? Because what he said is, listen, if you don't acknowledge me in front of people, I'm not going to acknowledge you in front of my Father. Well, that word acknowledge, it means to recognize, but the idea is, is a little bit stronger than that. It's, it's accept, embrace. It's almost like a, to pledge allegiance to. Right? So, so think about it like that. Jesus is, you know, we usually use these verses to, to say, you know, we need to be bold with our faith and not shy away from telling the truth. And I think that's, that's right here in these verses. But Jesus is basically saying, listen, if you don't pledge allegiance to me now, I won't pledge allegiance to you later. And implied in that statement is we have to pledge allegiance to Jesus. We have to accept and embrace him if we want a later before our Father in heaven. Not only that, um, episode 11 of the Rugged Truth podcast, we talked about the unforgivable sin, and we looked at Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. We won't rehash that passage because all you got to do is go back and look uh, or listen to uh, episode 11 of the Rugged Truth podcast. But we saw that at its core, the unforgivable sin is denying Jesus, denying that he is who he said he is, that he is God himself in the flesh living among us, that the Holy Spirit was working through him. And so denying Jesus is the unforgivable sin. Now think about that. That's a claim to exclusivity. That's Jesus saying, listen, if you don't recognize that I am who I am, your sins won't be forgiven. And we know from other passages in Scripture that if our sins are not forgiven, then we will not be welcomed into eternity with our Father who is in heaven. And so in several places, these are just three, there are several others. These are three places where Jesus either explicitly or implicitly helps us understand that it's only through a connection with him that we are able to enjoy a, a secure future, a significant eternal relationship with the creator God in heaven. Now, we could say, well, you know, Jesus was saying those things, but is there other testimony? Jesus' closest friends, the men that he spent the most time with, also said the exact same things. In fact, in the book of Acts, the apostle Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, he's on trial. He's been hauled before the Jewish ruling council because he won't shut up about Jesus. Can you blame him? <laughs> And in Acts chapter 4, he finds himself on trial and he speaks to these rulers who are judging him. He's in court. And this is his testimony, Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, they'd healed somebody, 
By what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus, Peter says, is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And here's the kicker. Peter says this, and there is salvation in no one else. Talking about Jesus. There is salvation in no one else. And then he goes on, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, says, listen, there's no other way to be saved. Nobody else can save you. There's no other name we've been given by which we can be saved. That's him saying, Jesus really is the only way to heaven. Maybe Peter was confused. No, that's the message of the apostles throughout the New Testament. We'll we'll take a look at another one. This one is found in uh, 1 John, written by uh, one of Jesus' closest friends as well, right? Jesus had 12 disciples, three of them. Uh, we call his inner circle Peter, James, and John. They appear to be closer to him than the others for some reason. They're, maybe they just connect, have more in common. I, I don't know, right? But John wrote some letters later in his life. And in 1 John chapter 5, he makes a very bold statement that we ought to pay attention to. 1 John chapter 5 Verse 11 um, is where I'm going. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, John writes this. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And there it is again. A bold statement that Jesus really is the only way to heaven. If you have the Son, you have eternal life, John says. If you don't, if you haven't entered into a relationship with the Son, connected with Him on a deep level, asked for the forgiveness of your sins, accepted Him as Lord, if you have not embraced the Son, if you have not embraced Jesus, John says, then you do not have eternal life. That's a bold statement, a very explicit statement that not only Jesus, but Jesus' closest friends believed that he really is the only way to heaven. So, is Jesus really the only way to heaven? I believe the answer is yes. I I believe that the definitive answer to that question is is a firm Yes, Jesus said so, and Jesus validated his claims with miracles. And ultimately, he validated all of his claims with the resurrection. And because he was able to do that, to me, that gives him more credibility than most. And so when he answers that question, if we were to ask him, Jesus, are you really the only way to heaven? He would answer, yes, I really am. Put your faith and trust in me so that you can receive that eternal blessing. Jesus has credibility because of what he can do, what he did do. And so his answers matter. His closest friends got that message from him and shared it with the people. Peter shares it in a court testimony. John shares it in a letter. See, I believe the Bible is telling me the truth about this because I believe the Bible is inspired by God. Back to my presuppositions and and my worldview. And so when given an opportunity to talk about this with someone, I'm I'm very upfront. Listen, you need to understand, I'm going to answer this question for you, but, but here's why I'm going to answer this question a certain way. I believe the Bible's telling me the truth. I believe Jesus is telling me the truth because of he performed miracles. And in answer to that question, Jesus said, yes, he really is the only way to heaven. We don't want to be jerks 
when answering this question for people. We, we don't want to be the reason they just turn off and stop listening to Jesus' call to them to come to him and receive eternal life through him. And so we, we don't want to be jerks about this. We don't be rough and tumble and, you know, just cut and dried, black and white, that's it. At the same time, too, we don't want to be ashamed of this truth, right? Uh, Jesus makes that point in the Matthew passage that we read. We, we, we don't want to be ashamed to embrace this truth and boldly proclaim that, yes, we believe Jesus really is the only way to heaven. And so there's a balancing act. That's what I mean by finesse. We need to be careful how we answer this question. Do it without anger. Do it with love. Pray. Ask God to give you persuasive words. Maybe you're the tool the Holy Spirit is using to finally penetrate that heart with the truth. And who knows? Maybe you'll find that person in heaven someday and you'll rejoice. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we thank you so much for the truth of your word, for giving us an opportunity to explore it together and to answer this question that real people are asking about real life with you. Are you the only way to heaven? Lord, I believe the answer to that question is yes. And I pray that if somebody's watching this and they're trying to decide whether or not they believe that too, that maybe this presentation has been uh, persuasive enough to get them to consider accepting you as the Lord and Savior of their lives. I want to thank you for the opportunity you give us here in the Rugged Truth Podcast to have open and honest conversations. I pray your blessing on this as it goes out into the world. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for uh, tuning in, so to speak, to the Rugged Truth Podcast. Do us a favor like this on YouTube or on the podcast platform you're listening to it. Uh, Subscribe to our channels. Share these podcasts and videos with uh, the people in your life. God bless you. We'll see you very soon.